Today we're going to talk about Spencer Torkelson and Spencer Turnbull. Didn't mean to do a Spencer show, but here we are all today on Locked on Tigers. You are Locked on Tigers, your daily Detroit Tigers podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another edition of Locked On Tigers. I'm, of course, your host, Scott Bentley. Today is Wednesday, November 1st, 2023. Thank you so much for making Locked On Tigers your first listen. Every single day, we are free and available wherever you get your podcasts, including YouTube, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team, every day. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers can get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's 150 bucks. If your team wins, visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. All righty. Well, welcome back. Hope everybody had a safe and fun and enjoyable Halloween on Tuesday evening. Uh, we are going to talk about Spencer Torkelson and Spencer Turnbull. Uh, I did not mean to do a Spencer show. That was an accident, but it's kind of funny. So now we're rolling with it. Um, Torgelson, obviously a lot of people want to talk about his 2023. I don't think anyone is really in question about like what his role in 2024 is going to be, but I do think, uh, his 2023 is a very, one of the most talked about things of this season. It's one of the bigger storylines. It's one of the, the, the most, one of the most important things to happen in 2023 was a regained confidence in green and torque. And uh, obviously there's not a ton of confidence in green to maybe like stay healthy. But as far as the two of them as baseball players, I think they both took pretty big steps in a positive direction in just reminding the fan base of why they were hardly regarded prospects, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Um, so we'll talk about him. We're going to talk about Turnbull. I don't have too much to add on the Turnbull situation. We've been talking about it for months and months and months. I think it's one of the strangest and, weirdest situations I've seen in quite some time, to be honest. Uh, so we'll, we'll kind of talk about that and, and what it means for 2024, I guess. And then we're actually going to end the show by talking about Frank Howard, who is a baseball legend and lifer that passed away on Monday, I believe. Um, just uh, kind of talk about him as well. Just a big name uh, and a big, big personality, big human being. Uh, sad to see him pass away. So we'll end the show with that. Uh, also played for the Tigers a little bit at the end of his career, obviously. Um, so let's talk about Torkelson. Okay. So Spencer Torkelson in 2023 ended the season a with 159 games played, which like, obviously he plays first base. It's not as physically demanding as some of the other positions out there, but that is comfortably the most games played on the team. Uh, Spencer Torkelson 159. The next closest was McKinstry at 148. And then Javi and Veerling at 136 and 134. And then after that, you get into Carpenter, Ibanez, Short, who all played less than 120. So uh, availability, which is is not for nothing. I don't want to to uh, a lot of people just in the in the newer age of baseball. I think uh, forget that I'm not one of those like the best ability is availability, like whatever. But uh, it is it is a lot more important than I think some people give it credit for. So him going out there and playing almost every single game. Uh, give him his flowers in that regard, uh, was very famously, famous is probably a little bit too dramatic of a word, but uh, was very loudly, was very, um, we're going to say famously, uh, the first Tigers 30 home run hitter in quite some time. He ended with 31 homers, 88 runs, and 94 RBIs. His slash line was a 233 average, a 313 OBP, a 446 slug. That is good enough for a 759 OPS, which is a 107 WRC plus. So about 7% better than league average in that regard. Uh, his war was only 1.4 on fan graphs. We'll talk about that here in a second. Uh, and then he had a 9.8% walk rate and a 25% K rate. Uh, what other stats can we throw out here? Uh, his BABIP was only 269. That's pretty low. So hopefully that goes up. Uh, water kind of finds its level there as the season goes along. I had the second highest isolated power on the team, only behind Jake Rogers. Uh, and the two of them were the only two that had an isolated power over 200 
Carpenter would have if he hit literally a single home run in the last six weeks of the season. Um, yeah, that's probably it for all like the, the counting stats we can give you there. So a solid season uh, and a better than league average hitter, over 30 home runs, almost 100 RBIs. This was this was a very, again, important season for Torkelson. The one thing I'll say is that this is, well, I'll say a lot. I shouldn't say the one thing I'll say. I get paid to, my, my job is spending half an hour saying things every day. Um, Torkelson, it was not just he showed up and, he, and it just like clicked one day, right? Like this guy was constantly making adjustments. There was a lot of mechanical adjustments and, and other adjustments, even non-mechanical, that he was making on and off the field to get here. This was a lot of hard work. This was this was a lot of tinkering and moving hands and 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 uh, timing on when to shift weight. That was a big thing with his like mechanics and and just his his batting stance and how that worked out. Like I said, hand placement was a big thing. Bat path is a big thing. Um, type of bat is like there, there's there's so many things that went into like the adjustments that he made to this season. This was not like development is not just oh just wait and eventually this person figures it out. So I want to give him credit. The reason I'm bringing that up is is to give him his flowers. He made a ton of adjustments as minute and as small as they may seem to the naked eye or may seem to us the viewer. Uh, this guy was putting in a lot of work to make adjustments to get to a point where he was hitting the ball really well, especially, obviously, in the second half of the season. I think one of the things you can point to very uh, quickly is just like when you're talking about what you want to see out of him next year, maybe let's avoid the slow start, right? That was another thing in April this year. He had a 599 OPS with two home runs and a 215 average. Then in May, he had a 784 OPS. June, a 715 OPS and a sub 200 batting average, although seven home runs in the month of June. July, 749 OPS, but then August and September, 892 OPS in the month of August, 819 OPS in September, and then in the three games or four games in October, had an 833 OPS for whatever that's worth to you. So his pre and post All-Star game splits, he had a 711 OPS. That is below league average hitter for the first half of the season. Post All Star break, eight sixteen with a slugging percentage of almost five hundred. Very very good adjustments made in that regard. Obviously, so I think that that's somewhere that you can still just be like, hey, maybe we have the second half, and and because it is how it is chronologically, we can kind of give ourselves some optimism about like, okay, well maybe that's who he is, right? If it was first half hot, second half cold. We'd be like, oh, we need to get back. How do we get back to what he did in the first half? Because it's the most recent baseball we've seen of him. We go, okay, let's just carry that over and get a full season of the second half version of you. That would be beautiful. Okay. So that's somewhere to start. I also think it's it's very important for him to be better with runners in scoring position. That's something that's not new. We talked about that a lot this season. Um, there's no, again, like mechanical like adjustments or whatnot. Part of it is the style of hitter you are. Uh, but I think he's trying to like do too much at times, especially in the first part of the season. And in what was it? There was, was it August or July? There was one month where he literally, I think it was July, where he literally had zero hits with runners in scoring position the entire month. So uh, I think he did like 0 for 20 something with risk for over a month. So if you want to be a middle of the lineup bat, 30 home runs or not, you need to be better with risk. Um, 208 average, 296 OBP, sub well under sub 400 slug. He had a 667 OPS with risk this season. I, I think part of that will get better just as time goes along. He gets more opportunities, uh, just matures as a hitter a little bit, and again continues to make some adjustments there. But um, I, that is another thing that's like pretty obvious to, to point out early on here. Um, let's talk about like the nitty gritty of what he improved on at the plate what what the biggest differences was between 2022 and 2023 and then obviously we'll talk about what we want to see him continue to improve upon in 2024 okay we'll do that right after i tell y'all about our friends over at drum roll please FanDuel. the nfl season is obviously here and you can score early with nfl 
you can score early this NFL season with America's number one sports book, and that is FanDuel. Right now, new customers can get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's $150 if your team wins. If you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there's no better time to get in on the action. The app is so easy to use. There's a wide range of betting options, spreads, player props, over-unders, and more. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and kick off the NFL season. FanDuel official partner of the NFL. All right, everybody, welcome back here. Segment two of Locked On Tigers. I appreciate y'all for tuning in, making us your first listen every single day. Shout out to the everydayers that do tune in every day. We will be back tomorrow. We still got to do Akil Badu. Uh, we might save him for last. Tomorrow might be the last deep dive we do, though. We're getting pretty close here to the full roster. Um, but Akil, whether it's tomorrow, it'll be this week. Whether it's tomorrow or uh, or the next day's episode, uh, Akil Badu deep dive. Because that's a really, really, I think, kind of big conversation for what to do with Badu and how his winter is going to look like, right? We'll talk about his 2023, obviously, and we'll talk about what he needs to improve on in 2024, what he did well in 2023. But I think the biggest conversation around Badu is is just what is going to happen with him this winter. We'll have that conversation shortly. For now, though, we're having a conversation about Spencer Torkelson. Um, So where to even start? I guess we'll start with... Uh, we'll we'll talk about what we said we were going to talk about. Uh, in, in 2022, this is a hitter who genuinely just could not time up a fastball. And when you're talking about a guy who so much was expected out of him in the power department and just at the plate in general, uh, I remember on draft night when, when Avila <laughs> drafted him as a third baseman for whatever ridiculous reason, um, well, I know the reason, but it was a ridiculous reason. Um, you know, people were like, oh, well, is the third base thing going to work? Is he going to move to first, et cetera, et cetera. And people were like, it doesn't matter. And you're like, why does it not matter? And they said on the MLB network broadcast, what position does Torkelson play? He plays offense. That was the entire premise of this draft pick was this is supposed to be a really, really good major league hitter. And to see him just just have a complete inability to hit a fastball. His numbers against four seam fastballs, which he saw comfortably more than any other pitch in 2022 because he literally couldn't hit them. Uh, He hit 175 with a 292 slug. His Woba was 277 against four seam fastballs. That is, that is obviously very, very weak and very, very poor. Um, his four seam fastball numbers in 2023. Okay. 265 average, 278 expected average, a 514 actual slug, and a 566 expected slug. The X Woba, which is sounds very, very scary, expected weighted on base average, 405. So uh, an expected weighted on base percentage, essentially. Uh, of of over 400 against the four seam fastball, very good numbers. Nine home runs of his 31 were against the four seamer. Uh, he hit well against the sinker. He hit really well against the cutter. My goodness, 367 average with a 700 slug against the cutter this year. Every variation of a fastball he hit well against. He went from I'm holding a phone cord because I have ADHD. Um, his run value in 2022 against four seam fastballs was negative eight dreadful this year it was positive five so very big steps taken in that direction now really across the board there's only one pitch really that i think there was not a like that's the next step in his development oh two there's two pitches that i think are part of the next step in his development path here but really a lot of pitches right like uh the sinker we already talked about 255 the curveball 220 average 634 slug against the curveball this year, five home runs and uh, and two doubles as well. Seven extra base hits against the curve. Um, the sweeper, sub 200 average, but a couple of homers against and saw it only 5% of the time. Like He really took some steps forward across the board. All of his numbers got better. Uh, it's, I guess maybe the sinker got worse, but he still like hit pretty well against it. Uh, the, the two pitches that he needs to take strides in again, if we're going to talk about his next step in development, is against the slider and against the changeup. 
He hit 127 against changeups and 203 against sliders. They are also the only two pitches that he saw like a legitimate amount of time, like more than like 5% of the time, that he had a whiff rate higher than 30% on. And as a whole, this season, his whiff rate was slightly better than league average. 52nd percentile in whiff rate. So if he can do better against, I just kicked my table, goodness. If he can do better against the slider and against the changeup, in 2024, that will improve his numbers even more. Again, just seeing a lot of those pitches obviously helps, but he's going to continue to make adjustments against Major League Hitting. On a thing that I think is a good sign is that he was still able to hit home runs and hit extra base hits against sliders and against changeups, despite maybe the, the low batting average against them and the high whiff rate against them. His home run distribution is beautiful. He hit a home run against pretty much every single pitch he saw this year, except for a splitter, which he only saw 1.9% of the time. Looks like he only saw about 12 splitters. Oh, 53. There it is. 53 splitters all season and 12 plate appearances. So outside of that, he hit at least two home runs, not even at least one, at least two homers against every other pitch type. Nine against the four-seam fastball, four against the slider, five against the sinker, three against the changeup, five against the curve, three against the cutter, two against the sweeper. So the fact that he has shown now the ability to hit the home run against any pitch he sees is another fantastic sign of development. As far as what to expect out of him in 2024, okay, he hits the ball very hard. 94th percentile in hard hit rate, 89th in barrel percentage, 87th percentile in average exit velocity, 83rd percentile in expected slug. Okay. Like he, he hits the ball very hard. He doesn't chase a lot of pitches, which is great. And that's been something that we've noticed since very early on, even when he was struggling. So that that's good. There's, there's, I guess two things. It's like one and a half things. One, I would love to see him walk more. Um, if you are going to be a 235 to 245 batting average hitter, but you're going to be a home run threat, I need you to walk more. And he didn't not walk. He had a 9.8% walk rate. That's 67th percentile, right? Once you get into the double digits, you're considered to be pretty comfortably above league average. League average this year was a little under eight and a half percent. So he, he was well above league average. Okay. He walked, he walked far more than the league average hitter. Um, but again, his OPS was 759 while hitting 30 homers. There's no reason that your perennial, like your power bat in the lineup that's hitting 30 plus home runs a season shouldn't have an OPS in the 800s. And he wasn't like particularly close, like 40 OPS points away is not like knocking on the door. So I think a walking more will help that. that that's something that I would really love to see. B, you kind of like this is going to sound maybe maybe weird, but like you, you need to figure out exactly what type of hitter long term you're going to be. We saw him pull the baseball a ton this year, right? Pull and elevate. That was a big thing. Uh, Jerry on Twitter talked about it a lot. Obviously, like that that is something that helped him a lot. Kind of unlock that power and unlock those numbers. Now. If it's if we're just like okay, he's gonna be like a, at best a 250 batting average hitter. He's probably gonna be in the 240s at his best, but he's gonna hit 35 ish, maybe even more homers, and he's gonna walk a ton. I'm I'll sign me up for it. I, I'm that's not that's 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 fine, right? OPS in the it, well into the 800s, you know, the mid or even upper 800s. That'd be awesome. Okay, I I've, I've no issue with that. Um, the expected batting average this year was 251, which is right just a hair under league average. Um, we need to figure out what the long-term approach is here. Because again, if 760 OPS is the limit, that's that that shouldn't be the limit. That 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 should not be the limit for him. He should be able to take another big step forward. Now, again, second half of 2023. OPS of over 800. What was it? 811 OPS in the in post All Star break this season. So he has the ability to go on to prolong periods of times of good hitting. But we we just need to really figure out 
Is is this the the mindset? Because he even started hitting opposite field home runs toward the end of last season, of this season, I guess, 2023. Are we going to try to spray the ball to all parts of the parts, <laughs> all parts of the field a little bit more? Are we going to just maintain the 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 pull and elevate mindset? What exactly is the profile of Torkelson long term? That's my biggest question going into 2024, and I don't have an answer. I don't think we will have an answer until we watch him play in 2024. I have no, but like, like people, when he was playing, he was ahead of his time, uh, Adam Dunn was. People loved to give Adam Dunn a ton of heat when he was playing because he hit for like a 200 batting average. But he hit 40 plus bombs, and he walked a boatload, right? And I'm not saying Torkelson is Adam Dunn. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying, if you're going to be a lower average guy, if this is like what it is, like, okay, like 235 to 250, you need to walk more than 9.8% of the time or else you're going to be a 30 home run hitter that 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 has, you know, a, a, a upper 700s OPS. And if you want to be that true heart of the lineup on a good Tigers team, we need that OPS to be much higher than 760. 759. So that's the next step in development for me. Also, just value wise, it needs to be better defensively. Like, needs to. Uh, th- th- this guy's athletic. Like, there's no excuse for Torkelson to be a negative 7 OAA at first base. That's preposterous. Uh, and that is why his war was still only 1.4 this season, despite the good year at the plate. Because A, war already doesn't like first baseman. Positional value is a thing, right? B, when you're a bad defensive first baseman, it's really going to hate you. He's a 30 home run hitter that it was less worth, worth less than one and a half wins, according to Fangraph's war. So you need to be better defensively, even if you're league average, dude. I'll take a minus one OAA at first base. It's going to raise the value a lot. It's going to make him a lot more value, but he's great at scooping. No one's denied that. He's one of the best scoopers legitimately in the game of baseball. And I think that that needs to be worked into the war formula. It has plenty of flaws. But negative seven OAA is so ridiculously bad. Like there's there's no reason for him to be that poor of a defensive first baseman out there on everything that's not a scoop play. Okay, cool. Um, I think that's pretty much it. More doubles, ideally. You'd like to see more, more non-home run extra base hits in a perfect world, I guess. Again, just like putting the ball in play more. Would, would would be great. Consistent hits. And again, like maybe, maybe the profile that they want to shape him into is, is more of the, you know, 245 hitter, but he walks a lot more. We, we just, we genuinely, that's my 2024 outlook. We have to see what type of profile he's really going to be. Cause there's no denying he hits the ball hard anymore. He can hit the ball hard and he can hit the ball hard consistently and he can hit 30 home runs. And that number is hopefully only going to go up. But the OBP, what goes into the on-base percentage, is is the big question for me. And again, second half of this season, OPS over 800. So hopefully we can just carry that in to 2024. Okay, middle of the lineup bat next year. No really questions asked. That's gonna be uh, that's gonna be a thing, and we'll see how it works out. Okay, let's talk Turbo. We will talk Spencer Turnbull right after I play this cool video. All right, welcome back here. Third and final segment of Locked on Tigers. Appreciate you all for tuning in. Uh, I don't have too much to say about Spencer Turnbull. This is going to be a relatively short conversation. 2023 was really weird. I was more excited than anybody for Turnbull's return in 2023, right? This is a, uh, a guy who... Before the Tommy John, I was super, super high on. I thought his stuff was nasty. I've been high on Turnbull since he was in the minors, right? Like I, I, I've been really big on him since he was in Toledo. I, I've, I've been a huge fan of the, his his pitch mix and his repertoire. I, I, it's just command. It's always been command. He struggles consistently putting the ball anywhere, and his mechanics have changed over the years. And he had like the double hitch thing. That he did, like he did, like a pump fake on the mound out there. I'm not sure whether that really helped too terribly much. 
it's it, it's just it's been a whirlwind. And now already because he was kind of a late bloomer in uh, in the development department in the minor leagues, now all of a sudden he's 31 years old, and and we're heading into next year, and we're not sure really what his long term outlook is. Are when you write up your 2024 Tigers rotation. Do you have Spencer Turnbull anywhere near penciled in in the rotation? I would imagine no. I certainly don't, right? So, like, what's even the game plan here? Scott Harris said after the season in the postseason presser, or media availability, I guess, is more probably what it was, um, he he had said that he plans on Turnbull to come back next year and and – uh, compete in spring training for a spot in the rotation. Good for him. Does anyone think that's going to happen? I don't. I, and like, I could be totally off base here and just, I'm not in those rooms in the conversations that they have. I don't think that this is like a, a really positive, happy go lucky relationship. This is a guy who, who got demoted. Then changed agents to be a Scott Boris client and within like minutes of becoming a Boris client then was magically on the IL instead of getting demoted. It's been an, a, a movie. Like if this happened, if, if we were the Yankees, this would have been like a national story. Like th th this is so, I've never seen anything like this. Genuinely. I, I have not seen something like this in my lifetime and it, it, it's it's so wild to me. So, like, I, I have no clue. I, I have no clue what's going to happen. My money would be on if there were prop bets on this on FanDuel, which, like, there's obviously not. My money would be on, on him being not a part of the Tigers organization in 2024. I know Harris said what he said. I I, I call baloney sandwich. Like, I, I, I just can't fathom that they're just going to go through with – the winter and both parties are just going to be like, yep, let's just go into spring and compete for a job. Like what? He, he's not going to, he's not going to make the team again. He's going to get option again. His MLB service time is going to be like not clicking again. That's why he wanted to go on the injured list in the first place is because they wanted to get him to free agency quicker. You're already trying to figure out how quickly you can get to free agency. You're 31. Like it's, it's just mind boggling to me, this whole situation. And, and I, I can't, get get past it like i i can't just be like oh yeah he'll just walk into spring and we'll just see what happens I, I i don't believe that i really don't and again i've been wrong about plenty I, i'm i'm sure i'll be wrong i know i'll be wrong about plenty more maybe this is one of those things but my goodness i it's it's just such a unique and wild situation i i i can't fathom that he just Stays on the 40-man roster through the winter, shows up to spring, competes for a job, gets option to AAA when he inevitably doesn't make the rotation, and then everything's just still fine. It wasn't fine this year. Why would it be fine next year? I don't know. I, I could go on and on. The one silver lining would be if he was willing, completely willing, like no questions asked willing, to be a reliever. That's the only thing where like if they've had conversations with him and have decided like we want you in the pen, work on it over the offseason, come into spring training, you can win a bullpen spot for this team in 2024. That's the only thing that I could see like his route to being on the major league roster for the Detroit Tigers next year. If it's not that, I don't see it. And that's why it would not shock me at all within five days of the World Series, if he was non-tendered, it would be the least shocking thing in the world to me. I I, I just, like I said, I, I know what Harris said, but I I, I kind of call, I kind of call bologna sandwich on it, man. It's wild. It's super wild. We'll see what happens. Obviously this year dealt with injuries. They deal with injuries. I'm not trying to make it sound like he just like made them up or pulled them out of thin air. Like he, he did deal with some injuries um, and struggled. Well, I mean, he had a 7-2-6 ERA and a whip of almost 1-7 uh, in 31 innings this year. He really struggled to start off the season, didn't do very well. So we will see what happens.
Uh, and that brings us to the end of the show. Uh, I just wanted to say rest in peace to Frank Howard. Frank Howard ended his Major League Baseball career with the Detroit Tigers, uh, was a, a bigger-than-life personality, uh, personality-wise and in physical stature. Obviously, now uh, for those who were around to see him play in the 60s and 70s, he was the six foot seven. 255-pound uh, corner outfield corner outfielder slash first baseman uh, played for the Dodgers, won rookie of the year for the Dodgers. Uh, he was like one of the – he he was such a, a power hitter. And Ted Williams, uh, I th- believe the Yes Network actually put a video out of, uh, of their kind of – their their ode to him and, and, and talking about his passing – uh, they, they had said that he, Ted Williams was his coach at one point and said, no, he'd never seen anybody hit the ball harder consistently than Frank Howard, uh, played for the Dodgers. Like I said, then, uh, very obviously and very famously was one of the best Washington senators to really ever put on a Senator's uniform and was consistently in MVP conversations, 40 home run hitter several years in a row, almost hit 50 one season. I mean, this is legitimately had more walks than strikeouts one year. Uh, this is is very, very legitimately one of the the best hitters of a generation. And he was such so integrated with the game of baseball, stayed around the game of baseball for his entire life. Uh, really was a a baseball lifer through and through. And uh, like I said, obviously ended his career with the Detroit Tigers in seventy two. And 73 didn't play in too many games, but uh, cool for him to end his career there. So um, thank you to Frank Howard for a uh, for being a, a beautiful part of this beautiful game that we love so much, and, and being just such a again a bigger than life figure on and off the field. So rest in peace to Frank Howard. Thank you so much for making Locked On Tigers your first listen every single day. Appreciate y'all for tuning in. We will be back tomorrow. All right. Peace and love. Going to therapy's dope. I'll catch y'all then, baby. Go Tigers.